don't feel pain. So we have to look more towards raising the ambient temperature enough to actually hit, get them to hit the flash point, usually through direct contact with fire itself. One of the earliest fire weapons was actually fire arrows. This is, what most people think of fire arrows is just that you have a little piece of string with some flammable material tied around to it. But if you actually think about it, when you pull your bow, the arrow head is right here, which means this would burn your hand. Wow. Actual fire arrows were oversized arrows with the little thing tied around there, so the actual extension of the arrow was much larger. This altered the flight trajectory of the arrow. It definitely hurt the range of the arrow and the arrowhead was usually a lot bigger. This was actually done by design. If you have a regular arrow, if you've ever seen an arrow being fired, it actually fires at a very, very fast speed. So if you fire just a regular fire arrow, usually the fire will gutter out before it actually hits the enemy. Uh, mostly it was used as a uh, weapon to uh, make the other enemy, the receiving core, afraid, uh, because fire is very, very terrifying to deal with. As we've said, whites don't feel fear. So that's kind of uh, useless. Mm -hmm. However, there is an actual weapon that we can design that is very, very different. What we use is a small thing of iron uh, wires and a hollow shaft and a hollow arrowhead. And in that, you can put a coal, burning coal. Because coals burn at a higher temperature and are much, much less resistant to wind, you can actually fire that at a greater distance. You still have to basically fire and release, you're not gonna get very much accuracy because fire burns and convection is a thing, so you don't wanna burn your bow hand. But you can actually use that, if you wanna go and fire into the largest concentration of whites you can. If there are any snow bears or snow cats, that would be the ideal target because when they go up, convection means that the air temperature heats up around it. Then you're gonna go and get the white next to them to go up and that'll get the next white to go up and so on and so forth. So you wanna be able to burn these large formations of others. I call this the cascade fire scenario and I'll be using this a lot during this, uh, basically a cascading fire to set the white armies ablaze and if the others are there, they're probably going to retreat rather than risk being hit with, I'm not exactly sure what we said. We don't know exactly how the others like it, but given that they are ice fairies, I'm guessing fire is not too kind to them. So. Now, if you want to, the problem with that is that, uh, well, arrows do have a good range, but you want to engage them at as far a range as possible. So if you have the chance, if you know the others are coming, building siege engines are probably your best bet. If, uh, if you're familiar with the idea of what a catapult is, the actual idea, uh, the actual term is manganel. It's a little bucket, uh, bucket arm thing that uses torsion and fires like that. Mm -hmm. You can actually use what's called, uh, do we have any uh, baseball fans in the audience? Do we have any baseball fans? Okay, you guys know pine tar? Pine tar is actually a medieval thermal weapon. It was used actually as caulk in the Middle Ages to caulk boats and barrels and buckets. If you thicken it up with a little bit of a thickening agent, in, the, uh, in history, typically animal fat was what was used, but given that animal fat is actually useful to eat, I would say actually sawdust would be a better option for what we're dealing with. Uh, you can actually thicken it out into something called pitch. Now pitch was typically used for roofs in, uh, middle age, in the Middle Ages. You would use it to help waterproof your roof if it was made out of thatch. But pitch is very flammable and kind of like napalm, it's a, more of a jelly. So it'll stick to whatever it's, uh, t whatever it's uh, hitting and it will burn out much slower because it's so thick, as opposed to a liquid, which burns out relatively quickly. If you get that, then this cascade fire scenario will happen even more likely because the others seem to have this ability to lower the ambient temperature around them. We see they, they bring the snow and all this other terrifying stuff, and you see that fires kind of gutter down in their presence. So making sure your fires are as long-lived as possible is the ideal ide uh, scenario for our purposes, which is to burn the white armies before they even get close. So you can fill up a bucket or fill up a barrel full of pitch, light it on fire, and set it out to a mangonel. Obviously, accuracy at that range is not going to be a factor. But the nice thing is, is that siege engines are still good for hitting formations. And as we've seen both in the books with the uh, the recollections of what happened at the Fist of the First Men, and at the show with the, the uh, iconic images of the uh, armies, they like to use formations. So if we can hit them, we can set their formations ablaze and hopefully burn the whites before they even get close. Uh, 
Uh, anybody have any questions? I'm just going to go give. I, mean, I don't want to wait for the end for questions. Um, similar to this, uh, and if you're building up siege engines and fortifications uh, on a larger scale, to be uh, specialized arrows that you were using on the uh, single shot arrows, uh, ballista also had specialized rounds. Um, yep. They were, for anti, yeah, they were used for anti phalanx, uh, so like you're saying, anti formation. Uh, yeah. Fire arrows. Yeah, so you can actually, there, in 1421, they showed that arbalests, um, larger, basically a ballista or an arbalest, yeah. think of it as an oversized crossbow. Uh, you, they actually had cartridges in them, which could be lit, uh, set, set ablaze, and right. usually that was done, the cartridge would have help protect the uh, actual flammable component from uh, the wind, the, from just being fired at an extreme velocity. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, I would say yes, you could actually use that, and that would especially be good for, uh, in the Middle Ages, ballista towers were a very big thing, especially going from the high into the late Middle Ages, the ballista towers were actually usually been able, you could actually cover the uh, ballista with a roof, which made it a lot better, a lot easier against counter fire. I don't know if the others use siege engines, they might. That would actually be a terrifying thing if they started catapulting white corpses into your fortifications Jeez. and then having them reanimate. Although I don't think that would actually work at Winterfell or Storm's End. We see that Bran the Builder seems to put a little bit of magic mojo into the walls. Yeah. So I think that the undermining of, you know, they could just say, hey, all of you whites start digging with your hands until you get under the walls of Winterfell. I don't think that that would actually work in anything that is built by Bran the Builder. So if you have to go in, Defend yourself. Winterfell or Storm's End are probably your best fortifications. They can walk under the uh, uh, moats of Winterfell, but there's no, or the moats of uh, River Run. They could probably eventually get into Casterly Rock, but there's no beating the magic that uh, good old Brandon the Builder could get, could get for us. Uh, this gentleman over here, green, is that a green hand shirt? Sir, 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 we get kind of like a money shot of uh, siege weapons and like how they work and how they load and how they fire. Is that like an accurate description and would that be effective at Winterfell? I do not watch the show, so I could not, I cannot clock. Uh, but however, uh, were, were these uh, naval based? Yes. Okay, so yes, actually, siege engines can be mounted on, uh, navy, on uh, naval vessels. They were originally used to fight other naval vessels, but as it turns out, that's so hard to actually aim them, that it was almost ineffective. Uh, in one of the most famous naval siege uh, weapons which actually could be used was Greek fire. The Byzantine army would have basically siphons that would spit out Greek fire, which the formula is actually lost to us. It's currently theorized that part of it was a petroleum base. There's natural petroleum reservoirs around the Black Sea, which the, the Byzantine would have access to. Uh, you could actually take, you could actually put out uh, Greek fire with urine and vinegar, which is why uh, ships that were facing the Byzantine navies would often use vinegar and urine-soaked hides that would put them on the sides of their ship. Uh, so that would, but they'd also do all, all, sorts, all sorts of other stuff. They'd actually fill pots with uh, Greek fire and then th try to throw them over the decks, over the, the hulls of the ship so that it would land on the deck and spread fire to both the very flammable deck and the very flammable crew, because water would not extinguish Greek fire, which was very, very terrifying if it was active. If you were on a ship and had to have a pot of fire come to you, they also threw pots of scorpions at people, which was just funny. But that, that's beside the point. That won't actually work against the, the whites. All right, anybody else have any other questions, or are we going to go to the next thing? Next thing, all right. So. You can actually also, if you are in an emergency situation, there are other thermal weapons you can use in an emergency. Merchant cranes are actually really good for dropping bales of burning hay on, uh, on troops. So if you are in a port or if you're on a ship, or if you're just, you know, if they just say, hey, congratulations, the whites, are, the whites have bypassed uh, Winterfell and are marching on King's Landing, what are you going to do? Well, that's actually one thing you can do is actually use combustible materials, load it onto a merchant crane, light it on fire, then drop it on your enemy. Uh, that was actually done by merchant ships who could convert themselves into essentially pseudo warships, not as good as any actual galley with marines loaded on board. But you gotta, if you're, you know, if you're in a fight for your life, do what you can. Drop, uh, drop a load, burn, load of burning hay on people. 
so I, that's what I think is another good idea to, to use. Now let's talk about how to beat the actual others themselves. Fire might work, it also might not, and you might just be in a dual situation where you're dealing with uh, a uh, with another. Now Dragon Glass, which is Obsidian, is actually the best weapon to use against them if you're not using Valyrian Steel. Dragon Glass is, an, is a volcanic glass, it's, uh, it's Obsidian, it's basically the Used by, uh, it's been used by the by peoples to create uh, sharp edges since the Neolithic, if you can actually believe it, because it's actually incredibly sharp. They use precision scalpels with obsidian tips today. You can actually cut almost on the molecular edge with an obsidian, with an obsidian blade just to show how impressive it is. But the problem is, is that obsidian is very brittle, so you can't make large blades with it because they will shatter. Uh, even the spearheads, they, they might shatter with, um, with enough, enough force if you're using it. So I would actually recommend using obsidian arrowheads against the others, because if the arrowhead is going to break, commonly actually, arrow shafts would break when upon impact with the enemy anyway. So if you're going to have a disposable weapon anyway, you might as well use range as a factor. We, we see that these others in, in the Waymar right, Royce prologue, they're almost supernaturally elegant. So what you actually want to do is drill your obsidian archers in volley fire techniques. Volley fire is when everyone will draw and fire at the same time. You might see it in certain war movies, they'll say draw and then fire, which is actually inaccurate. Um, fire was not actually used as a, a term for... Uh, it, was, it was actually, it was either new, loose or release was the, was the correct term. It, usually it was draw, set, not or uh, or draw uh, draw uh, knock draw uh, uh, pull and release or loose. Um, so when you you want to do that in volley fire because it makes them unable to dodge as effectively if many arrowheads are coming at them at once. And if your if your troops are finally drilled, they're less likely to panic. That's actually one of the things in military in the military. The reason why people drill so often it's that to replace that fear response. So instead of falling back onto the fight or flight response that happens when you're in a stressful situation, you actually fall back on the train. And that's what you want to do. You want your air, you want your archers to be able to hold their line, to be able to draw and loose as a single unit. The actual camaraderie of doing this is actually shown to have a beneficial effect to help keep people from fleeing. But also, we want to be able to del deliver concentrated fire against the others, and we don't want them to dodge with their supernatural, almost lazy elegance, they say, that they're able to just kind of, ah, I don't care. <laughs> well, you will, you will care if you have 25 obsidian arrowheads coming at you. I don't know if the, if the uh, how much the uh, others actually have human, uh, thought processes. I don't want to anthropomorphize them too much. They may in fact have different, it, completely alien thought processes, uh, thought processes entirely. But I do believe that they do remember that humans have been able to defeat them in the past, whether that be Azor Ahai or uh, The Last Hero or whatever. They're, they do remember that there were techniques used against them. Using these same techniques against them would probably cause them to be much more cautious and less likely to invade because their best tactic is actually to invade with overwhelming force. They don't care if their whites get down and they can reanimate them and every corpse that you lose, every person you lose is another basically reinforcing their army. So when you engage them, you want to lose nobody if you can or as few people if you have to. So the idea being is you want to be able to hit them and force them to not use this overwhelming force technology that gives you the time, the ability, uh, uh, tactic, not technology, I'm sorry. That will give you time to bring all of your people behind walls where they can no longer use these mass wave, effect, uh, wave, wave attacks against you. That way you can also have your fortifications, they can't just bowl you over. You have a good fighting base for your siege engines to launch from. You have food, you have fuel. Anything that you can use to actually keep your army at top fighting shape. If you have enough people, you can actually fight and man the wall in shifts. Just having a good night's sleep has been the bane of, I mean, people have lost, won and lost battles based on whether or not one enemy has had, or one side has had a good night's sleep. And if you can actually man, have your people manning the wall four shifts of six hours each, that's actually a tremendous fighting advantage. You can have, in the, um, have even non-combatants doing things as well to help them, 
uh, Battle of Doria Leum is the classic example. In the First Crusade, the Norman knights under Bohemond of, Tar of Taranto were basically backed to a river, and they had a shield wall. And the Seljuk Turks were basically using fire and retreat, basically trying to get them to bait them out of the shield wall. About six or seven hours into this, in the baking Turkish sun, these guys are still holding their wall. You had the women of the camp would go actually draw their water skins up from the river, basically wait until the last volley of arrows run up and start basically giving the troops water. And the priests and the non-combatants would be singing hymns, everything to do to help bolster their spirits. If there is a chapter that is going to do this in Battle of Winterfell, I'm guessing 100% Sansa is going to be the one leading the POV for the non-combatants. Basically think of it as a flip of the uh, the Battle of the Blackwater, where she, you know you had Tyrion as the Lannister troops, you had Davos as the Stan as Stannis' troops, and then you had Sansa inside with the non-combatant POV. Well, I think this is going to be a basic mirror of that, where she's actually going to be leading the the uh, efforts of the non-combatants to support the fighting effort. So she'll be organizing food deliveries, fuel deliveries, arrow deliveries. She'll be making sure the rotation is good, making sure you know, she'd have people watching to make sure all the night fires are burning and to deliver fresh fuel and, uh, and torches if they're starting to gutter out. I think that would actually be, if anyone could make a chapter about logistics seem interesting. I'm sure that Martin could do it. <laughs> All right. Does anybody? Do we have any other? I'll open it up to questions again. Does anybody have any questions? Is there a process by which you could use obsidian but not have it actually be sculpted into or, or chipped into anything? Where you instead maybe like taking an actual metal arrowhead or whatever and applying the obsidian to it rather than trying to sculpt. So actually, obsidian fractures on an edge very easily. Oh, okay. So you can actually manufacture small things with obsidian really easily. And if you wanted to use a, a melee weapon, the Aztecs, the Aztecs had a great example. One of them was called the Makuahuito. I apologize if I did not pronounce that correctly. My, 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 is hard to pronounce. <laughs> my Nahadal is not very good, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, so think of, when you're looking at a Makuahitu, uh, so unfortunately no surviving examples exist. The last one was actually burned in a fire uh, in 1800 or something, Jeez. but there are replicas that do exist, and there's enough uh, examples from the Florentine Codex that we're able to actually uh, build reasonable replicas. Think of it as basically a large wooden paddle. It looks like an oar. And then all along it, you have blades of obsidian, basically little chunks of obsidian. It looks like a saw when you're actually using it. So one thing I think we could actually use, if you could train maybe a squad, maybe a fire team, maybe a fire team or a squad, I think you could do about nine men trained with this sort of thing to kind of look for dogpile tactics against an, uh, an other. Because we've seen, we've seen that they're able to parry very lazily and elegantly. So what you want to be able to do is surround them from multiple sides oh, yeah. and try and hit them. So as long as one of those blades can get into, get past the defenses, yeah. I mean, according to what we've seen happen with right, Sam, Sam the Slayer, yeah, yeah. 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 All, you need, all you need is one hit. Right. So we, we, want yeah. to we want to train our, our Makwahito troops mm -hmm. in basically, think of them almost as dogpile tactics. You want to be able to swarm around them, hit them from multiple sides, and get one side, one good side. I just keep on thinking of that scene from Shaun of the Dead where they're going, don't stop me now. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. not long. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we just got to get Andy to play queen during that scene. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the Aztecs actually, I'm, I'm really hoping that uh, if, if George can, we could actually see some perhaps, uh, in, I don't know if it would be done in the actual main novel series itself, uh, they tend, these tend to stick more towards European and a little bit of Anatolian, but maybe if we get a, a book about the five forts or something like that, that, might, that would be a great time to use some Aquahitl, some Atlatls using an obsidian throne. I, mean, I don't know if anybody knows what the Atlatl is. The Atlatl is basically a, an Aztec spear thrower. Yeah. It is a phenomenally cool piece of, tech, uh, uh, piece of uh, I don't want to say that's ancient technology, if you could have, if you could have a obsidian tip spear thrown from an expert atlatl user, that would be something that is also an incredible, incredibly effective anti-other uh, fighting technique. Yeah. Okay. Let's see what else? Am I, am 
wow, I actually still got uh, I still got 20 minutes left. <laughs> still, oh, we still have plenty of time. I wanted to actually go and say this for I, I was hoping I was actually worried that I had too much time, sir. More important thing. I didn't get to the others. Yeah. Just like yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. so. Question was also set up. Uh, so you guys came in a little, little because, yeah, you, so you guys came in a little a little later yeah. because we actually came up with that. Oh, we just thought you know, I say this yeah. this is how I was actually priming I was priming everyone for this panel he earlier because I was talking like, about Kalk. Talking about winning winning yeah. through Kalk. So yeah, basically, yeah, Pintar. Yeah. Pine tar. Pine tar uh, is, fl is flammable. So how uh, pine tar is made? So when you actually uh, when you're making charcoal, uh, you basically you burn wood outside of the presence of oxygen. To, in order to basically you burn off all of the water and the organic volatiles, which if you ever notice when you burn wood, you get a lot of soot yeah. and uh, the cracking and things like that. All of those are actually organic volatiles and water being burned. Uh, so what you want to do is be able, you use basically a airtight mesh of moss and dirt, and you burn uh, you burn the wood, and you can actually this was actually a profession in the Middle Ages charcoal burning. Uh, they would go and they would be in their own little because it stinks when you actually do it. So you had to be kind of outside of the uh, outside of the community. Uh, in Germany, the charcoal burner was actually thought of to partake in strange, devilish practices because they weren't <laughs> close to the. Uh, you could have to have charcoal burners. Faith actually was to have faith in something that you knew nothing about. They actually, they actually did know a lot about it. They would actually tell by the smoke rising whether they needed to add more heat, add take heat away, and stuff like that. It was actually a very good science. You could bake charcoal. One of the things that was actually a byproduct of this was pine tar. There was a reservoir dug, and you could get pine tar. This pine tar was used as caulk. You could actually thicken it out with some sawdust, make pitch, essentially medieval napalm, load it up into a mangan load it up into a barrel, light it on fire, shoot it out of the mangonel into the formation of whites, burn them all, because convection is a thing. Once you hit the once the air gets hot enough, these whites are gonna hit the flash point. And then and then you just have a, a, a big fire. The reason another reason why you actually want to use siege engines for it is because you want to do this at a long range because you don't want to actually have a big raging firestorm next to your castle. That would not not be a very good thing. <laughs> but yeah, so I, 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 yeah, it's okay. I can re I repeat a, a couple of those things, and then we can also use arbalests. You can use fire cartridges. Basically, you could have a, a, the arbalest bolt. You hollow out the shell. You put a, a little metal uh, casing, and then you put a coal or something like that in there. Then you can close it up and fire it out. It'll catch on fire as the uh, metal as it burns through the whole thing, and because it's a uh, coal, it won't gutter out from the flames like a normal fire. It won't gutter out from the wind, and you can do that for I guess a little bit more closer range. And you can actually put arbalests under a roof as opposed to a catapult because of the uh, indirect fire trajectory. You cannot do that. So ballista, uh, uh, a ballista or arbalest, uh, depending on how you want to go. Depending on when and who you are. Yeah, yeah, depending on when and who you are. I mean, heck, we even call them scorp they even call them scorpions in the main, in the novel series, and that's an old yeah. Roman term. Well, yeah, well that's also mostly because uh, most we've seen in the novel series in the um, in American setting. Yeah, and well, and we've also seen them as an anti-personnel weapon, whereas an arbalest is more of a full-bledged, a full, fully, fully flown, or fully fledged siege engine. Oh, apologize. They, they gave me a 10 o'clock thing. I tried to load up with caffeine as best I could. <laughs> what? I mean, Ice and Fire Con After Dark is a lot of fun. Yes. The gentleman in the back. Do you, uh, how far do you think the others will make it before the police will be stopped? And will land? So that's a good question because the best indication we've given has been Daenerys' vision in the House of the Undying, which shows the trident. All the way down. But at the same time, those visions are subject to interpretation, and she is filtering it through the lens of Rhaegar and that sort of thing. So we don't know actually if she is seeing a, if she's seeing a literal vision of the others making it all the way to the Trident, or if she is visualizing this climactic final battle for the Dawn through the lens of the Battle of the Trident, which is the climactic battle that she knows and understands through her education with Viserys. 
So I don't want to use, I don't want to interpret those things as literally as possible because as we've seen in the books, when you interpret prophecies as literally as possible, that's usually how you end up bringing them about. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good old Cersei. (laughs) So I'm not, so I don't know if this is, uh, and we've actually also seen with the Forsaken chapter. Is everybody familiar with the Forsaken chapter? I don't want to spoil anything. Okay, I don't, don't, some people have decided that they don't want to, uh, that they don't want to do this. So we see actually through, we see a lot of uh, uh, Dampere's visions are actually filtered through his fears. Yeah. And so, again, we see that these visions from the uh, the Warlock's Wine uh, are, that they're subjective. They're taken through your own contextual understanding, which is great from a, from a writing standpoint because you can do a lot of cool things with it. But at the same time, it means that for us, objective viewers looking at it and trying to make predictions, we have to wonder what is being filtered through contextual understanding right. and, and what is actual, when is the cigar actually a cigar? <laughs> <laughs> so I think that the others will, I honestly think that the, the, other, the others will actually, it'll grow, go down into a sort of set piece battles. There'll be a battle at Winterfell, there may be a battle at King's Landing, uh, I'm not quite so sure, but I really think that uh, in essence the uh, the last battle is going to take place in Winterfell, and then I think the Dragon Riders are actually going to go through this curtain of light beyond the end, of, beyond the edge of the world, and then they're going to see what's actually going on with the Heart of Winter and, and other town. Uh, they're going to take the dragons out there and uh, basically take no prisoners, scorched earth style. I don't know if they're going to come back from that. I, I'm I assuming that would be now. after the wall has fallen. Oh, the walls, the wall, you don't build a wall that big without having it fall down. Right, right, right. It's right, just right. Yeah. Oh, well, just because of that whole thing, silverling, not wanting to get beyond the wall. Yeah, so I'm actually curious about, uh, curious about uh, that. I wonder if it's because it's an ancestral memory, right. or I wonder if it's just the actual, the recognition of the others beyond the wall. It's like, would the actual... Um, you know, could, could a dragon rider coax silver, you know, a, a dragon beyond the wall, or would their instincts take over and they say, no, we're not going to go there? Or does the same mm-hmm. magic that prohibits the, wall, you know, the others from being able to come no, near the no, wall? No, that, that, that is also true, but at the same time, we have seen dragons at Winterfell. Right. So it, it makes me wonder exactly what this sort of defensive magic that Bran the Builder has actually built. And given George's track record with magic, we're probably not going to know. Right. Just you're going to leave it vague. Right. Yeah, it's magic. It, it defies your mortal understanding. <laughs> so, anybody else? You know, like I said, I, I, I've ex- explained a lot of stuff. I think maybe are you guys all ready and willing to fight the others? Uh, gentlemen at the back. Uh, I don't know. I can't really break the idea. Could they use wildfire? Okay, so wildfire. The problem with wildfire is, logistically speaking, it is so unstable that it is actually a danger to transport. Right. Like, how would you deploy it? I mean, I know. Greek fire, which is what a wildfire is based on, is used by the Byzantine like naval battles. Mm-hmm. So how would you deploy it on like a land battle? So I would actually use it much the same way as I was talking about with my uh, my my burning pitch situation scenario. I would fire it from barrels outside uh, from mangonels. We've actually seen Tyrion drilling catapult crews with this, the, the green paint. Anybody who spatters is replaced. That actually might be a another nice little parallel from the Battle of Blackwater being translated to the final battle between the others. Uh, we might, I mean, George loves to bring bring the book, uh, the things from the first novels into the later novels, so yeah. I could definitely see that. Uh, again, without the ability to stabilize the compound, uh, just shipping it would be a danger. Uh, the, the, uh, the clear parallel is Weepy Dynamite. Is anyone familiar with Weepy Dynamite? So Dynamite is essentially a compound of, in, you, it was, I believe, diatomous earth originally, but then they used sawdust and wood pulp and stuff like that, soaked in nitroglycerin and then in a wrapper. Um, The problem was is that nitroglycerin would soak out of, and it would look like it was crying, hence the term weepy dynamite. When dynamite aged, it became much more unstable, and you could actually hear all of these, you know, nitroglycerin can be set off with jolts, and so you can actually hear all of these horror stories in World War II of uh, combat engineers having to dr- go in the back of trucks with weepy dynamite, crates of weepy dynamite, 
worrying that any bump in the road was going to set off yeah. one of them. And if one of them gets set off, the rest of them get set off and you are gone. That's just it. There's no coming back from that. So without the ability to maybe stabilize, having a stabilizing agent, or perhaps even if we actually wanted to really apply that, we could probably separate it into a binary compound and then ship it in two pieces that way, and then when it's ready to explode, you could actually just mix the wildfire there and then set it and fire it. I don't know exactly the process of how it works, of how it works, and we hear the, uh, I mean, the Pyromancer's Guild has kind of got a weird cargo cult alchemy vibe to them, so <laughs> applying the scientific method to their processes is just asking for failure. But I would say that uh, wildfire is just- area denial. You, you could, but again, the, the transportation of it to actual battle zones, it's just so dangerous. Yeah. Uh, you, you'd be burning down your own food stores. You could, I mean, what is it? Egg on the fourth used wildfire siege engines, so we know that you can actually implement them into siege engines, but he took them down and burned down half the Kingswood. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, that's about normal for Egg on the fourth. <laughs> he, he is a burning disaster, but. Uh, so without the ability to stabilize the compound, whether that be through a stabilization agent that just has to be applied every you know, 24 or 16 hours, or being able to separate it into a binary compound, I think it's just too dangerous to use outside of a defense of King's Landing itself. Now you could use it in King's Landing, I said, again as a substitute for the, um, for, uh, the burning pitch barrels that I was saying uh, before, but I, I wouldn't be the one to want to ship it by wagon up uh, the King's Road to Winterfell or to, uh, oh God, if you could, just, just thinking about Catelyn's chapters going up to the Erie and having uh, through those through those mountain passes. Oof. <laughs> but no, very good question. It's just, uh, Serwin. Um, do you think the others will employ more non-human whites uh, such as bears and chatter? Oh, absolutely. Or do you think it's more of a gimmick? Oh, absolutely. I think that all of the, I think that the others recognize that the, the physical prowess of bears, I mean, if you've seen, you know, polar bears, polar bears can just swipe at you and take yeah. your head off. Um, the ability for, I mean, I don't think they would maybe say use them to drag up siege engines or anything like that. They strike me as a little too um, arrogant to use the conceptions of man against uh, against their enemies. They, they tend to just be using just straight zombie walk. But we do know that the whites are intelligent. They're, they're not unintelligent. The mindless zombies that we see in typical zombie media. The the zombies or the others or the whites that came in through the wall specifically went and fought off or found officers. They didn't go on a mindless rampage right. as soon as they as soon as they uh, reanimated on on that side of the wall. So I think that the uh, the others would definitely use whatever corpses they find. Anything that they find that they can use, they will use. Uh, and how they're going to do that? I mean, heck, I wouldn't be surprised if they simply use the corpse, the corpses of the whites that fall, as just a ramp for the rest of them to go up the walls. That's that's again how I mean they're they're omnicidal. As, as far as I'm concerned, they're omnicidal. Everything that's not them is going to be exterminated. Yeah. Do you think they could use uh, falcons and ravens? See, that that's a good question because I could see them using falcons and ravens to possibly attack, but those they're not strong enough to actually do damage to a, to a person. Um, those those uh, might already have children in them, so the whites are probably warred by something. And so the question would be is can can the others use uh, why, or can, can they use them either to communicate with them directly or to go via skin changing uh, skin changing whites as essentially communication pro the same way that uh, the, the skin changers use. They use uh, birds as essentially reconnaissance platforms. Uh, I could see them using that if that is, if they are capable of doing that. I don't know if they are. I don't. I mean, we know that the whites are, are intelligent, but we don't know if they can use any of their magic powers that they have before. Unfortunately, we would need controlled tests. <laughs> <laughs> That you sound like the World War Z guys. Oh, I sound, I, no, I sound like Kyvern is what I sound oh, like. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Gentlemen in the back. What is your reverse of question? Oh, yeah. What are the humans yeah. using against people? Yeah. What will the others use against yeah. humans that we That's haven't true. seen? We yeah. yeah. talk about reconnaissance, we talk about other platforms. What will we see, like, 
some new method of uh, weaponry or something new that we haven't seen before? Like, they talk about ice spiders or other things. Oh, well, I mean, they're certainly going to use ice spiders. Ice spiders could be used to climb up walls. No. Uh, because, I mean, yeah, because, I mean, spiders have sticky, sticky, uh, I don't know what they're called. I can't remember what they're called off the top of my head. But uh, I could actually see them using um, using large, fi uh, large fish or whales as platforms to go and attack Essos if the attack on Westeros was actually a success, which I don't I don't believe it will be. Uh, just as a spoiler alert, I don't think the Night King's going to win. Um, <laughs> I could see them using... Uh, I could actually see them also using uh, fish to uh, ram into vessels to sink them to get to get the uh, the corpses of the sailors to actually reanimate and then have them come out of the water. Oh, creepy! I mean, if they're heavy enough, if they're heavy enough and the current's not, it won't just send them uh, willy nilly. Uh, then you could actually have them just walk underwater. The question is whether the current would be strong enough to actually sweep them away. In which case, they're just no. Well, I mean, they actually would still be a use. I mean. Who knows if ocean currents end up just depositing just a random twenty whites on the shores of Lys or something like that? <laughs> that would be that would be a fun short story or something like that. For maybe <laughs> and, and after the end. I mean, well, we've seen that um, with both uh, shipwrecks and aircraft crashes that that can be an effective means to distribute something across a very large distance. Yeah. yeah. Um, and without intending to distribute something. Mm -hmm. to a new location. <laughs> but the, the question is, is would the others actually deign themselves to use it to command to do so? Well, but at that point, you're sinking the ship. But no. then oh, yeah, but I mean, so certainly, yeah, again, place. we could see if, uh, if ocean currents do just work that way and they end up right. depositing them somewhere randomly in Essos or South Rios or, uh, or Nath or something like that, which the, the yeah. one thing the butterflies of Nath won't be able to kill would be a white. Right. Um, right, and it could be an unplanned but safe exclave. It could be. That they um, fall back on. And then the question would be is can can the others then distribute them or distribute themselves that way? Uh, because the question is, I mean, do the other would the others just you know, ride on the zombie whale to go where they need to go, which would be really cool. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I could see I could see that if, if that just ends up happening. But it's also possible that if uh, the dragon riders go to the uh, the heart of the curtain beyond the end of the, end of the world, and then all the whites would just stop dead, and the, the zombie the, right. the, the, the zombie magic is over, mm -hmm. and then you just have a bunch of weird corpses uh, washing up on shore. But well, but that's what happens with any shipwreck, anyways. That is true. Yeah. Luckily, they don't make more of themselves. Unlike no. our zombies from every other. Now that is true, yeah. Uh, you actually, well, I mean, we, I, we don't know exactly how it works, but we do know it looks like you actually need the others themselves to do it. Whites don't just make more whites. You need the actual, you need the actual mojo from yeah. the others to do it. Uh, Sir, when you had a question? No, a question. There's an interesting bit in both World War Z where people go to the I Caribbean to like be away from zombies, mm -hmm. yeah. and then they do exactly that. They just walk along the bottom. They walk the along the flipping bottom. Yeah. They yeah. had submarines yeah. saying they can hear the corpses, like they'll be that's on the bottom of the ocean yeah. and they're scratching on the outside of the hole. Yeah, yeah I get, it, it would depend on how how, how, fa how fast the currents are, whether the whether the weight of the light okay. is enough to actually uh, leave them balanced, or if, it, if it's so strong. I mean, we've, there are some currents that are so strong that just sweep you out too. Yep. You know, and then maybe a riptide will save you for a little bit, but right. I mean, riptides end eventually. Um, <laughs> We don't have any indication. Um, again, the only thing we've really seen as far as a central command center is this curtain of light beyond the end of the world where there is something there. So that's where I think if there is a command structure, that's where it's located. If there is some sort of uh, magical engine or something that powers them, or even if that's what's, what's the thing beyond the irregular seasons, I mean, that might actually be a conclusion of the books is that after the dragon riders take that out, the seasons sort of stabilize. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe not. I mean, George said the seasons are magic. So, um, Dragon Ball Z next. About selectives also, hive minds. So there might be a hive mind. Um, like well, it. speaking of season stabilizing, do you think there might be some minor freak out as in like a, remember the fall spring where there's a fall spring and then there's a summer, but the summer only manages to last a couple of months? Well, oh, I, I think it is entirely possible, first off, that the whites might always, or the others might always come back. You know, we, we're never going to be certain about that. Um, I think there might be. If if there were more books, I would say that's almost a definite. But with two books to go, there might not be enough time. Uh, 
word-wise to be able to implement a fall summer? Oh, always well, fresh word to be able to add any more words. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's fair. You have you have a point there. But I could I could I could definitely see a uh, a conclusion uh, of a uh, of a book six or something like that saying is and we won and then three years later no you didn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Dot dot dot. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly. Did anybody else have uh, had a hand up? Did somebody? Anybody? Okay, well, I think that'll, I mean, I'm about four minutes away from when I'm supposed to end the panel anyway, so I think that's good. But did, ever, did everybody enjoy it? Is everybody ready? Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Good job. Did everybody ready to the audience?